The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everyone. My name is Richard Delahaye, and I am the Director of Digital Marketing here at Intronix. Welcome to our webinar today, CryptoLocker, Probing IT's New Worst Enemy. I'll be the moderator for this session. First of all, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Mike Davis, CTO of CounterTAC Inc. Mike is responsible for driving the advancement of CounterTAC's revolutionary endpoint security platform, as well as lever leveraging his visionary approach to push defenders ahead of attackers. I'm also pleased to be joined by Nathan Bradbury, our senior solutions engineer here at Intronis who is one of our resident experts on IT security and who will offer best practices for backing up your clients to protect against crypto locker. So just to start off with a few housekeeping items. During the webinar, if you have any questions, feel free to share them using the Q&A panel to the right of the GoToMeeting screen, or the GoToWebinar screen, I should say. At the end, you'll be prompted to complete the survey So I'd also like to offer you a download today. You can download our CryptoLocker Tech Guide for more information on this topic. In it, we offer five ways MSPs can protect their clients from CryptoLocker and three steps to recover from any infection. So I'd like to encourage you to go to uh, the bit.ly link you can see on your screen and download this tech guide uh, uh, at your convenience. Um, <clears throat> and I, with that, I'd like to hand over to our main speaker today, Mike. Over to you. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, I'm excited to be here today. I'm glad everyone could join. We're going to be discussing what is essentially the, the number one threat out there right now in uh, the malware space. And uh, for me, this is kind of a, a big key focus of uh, what I do and what my work is. So at CounterTAC, we focus on providing uh, stealth technology that monitors, detects, and uh, helps you prevent problems on endpoints. And CryptoLocker, of course, is one of those key threats that are out there on endpoints. And in the end, we're really focusing on giving the end users here that are talking uh, or listening to us talk today visibility and context of what's really happening so you know what's really going on uh, in the, on the endpoint in the organization. So today we're going to cover a couple different things. Uh, first, the state of IT security, kind of give you an overall view of where we are and things. Of course, dive deeper into CryptoLocker and the malware universe in general. And then we're going to wrap things up with understanding how you can apply some best practices, um, including backup and to help defend against some of these different attacks. What's really interesting and changing right now when it comes to uh, the state of security is that we're seeing a blending of the lines. Uh, no longer is it just one person's job to deal with security. And so we've seen this fragmented and kind of uh, different approach where IT folks are being pushed into many different directions and security is pushing them. They have to know about backup. They have to know about securing the operating system, securing the network. And so what ends up happening is a lot of times companies get into the mind of building a bigger wall. You know, we're going to go ahead and take our castle, we'll put a moat around it, put up a big wall, and maybe we'll be safe. What we're finding out is that the malware is, is bypassing these walls, and as I like to say, the uh, you know, uh, village idiot is living inside the walls. 
um, and they're you know, right next to the King's Treasury. Right? And so the attacks are really starting to focus more on the endpoints uh, than on the network and more on uh, the endpoint instead of the servers. So we're really not seeing attackers go against servers or uh, even you know, networks at all anymore. Almost all the attacks today are really focused on the endpoints. And uh, the reason for this is very simple. That's where the weakest link is. And so by attacking the endpoints, the attackers can maintain the advantage they have. Even though we're spending lots of money on security and trying to uh, protect ourselves, the attackers only have to find one weak link. And so the attackers have realized that, why should I go ahead and try all these different things, trying to break into servers, which are usually patched much more aggressively than workstations? Uh, why should I go against networks that have firewalls and IDSs and you know things like that? Why don't I just go to the endpoints and convince the user to do something? So what's changed in the global attack landscape is that attackers have really become more targeted and coordinated. A uh, crypto locker is a great example of this. We'll talk a little bit about here, but core to crypto locker's capabilities is a malicious service that runs in the background. And there's many, many people that help make this service always available and working. So we're seeing a lot of attackers move out of the, you know, I'm going to create a virus or a Trojan to uh, just, you know, kind of infect people and maybe poke fun or make fun of my friends. And they're really leveraging their tools as a resource to criminal organizations. So we see a lot of developers and malware authors selling their services to the crime organizations that are paying them to build the targeted tools. And so we're seeing the, that the uh, crime organizations are targeting individual organizations and looking for those weak links within that organization. It used to be that it was just a shotgun-like approach. I'll just shut as many pieces of email I can, uh, see how many people go ahead and get infected. Now it's much more specific, much more targeted. We're also seeing financial gain uh, and financial ROI really becoming the focal of everything. You, know, you used to hear a few years ago that identity theft and people stealing money out of your bank account was the primary way attackers made money. And while that's still true, it is a part of that ecosystem today. What really changed is that what these attackers need, the return, is much higher than it's ever needed to be before. So they could have been happy with stealing $100 or $500 out of your checking account. That's not enough for them anymore uh, because they're doing this, they're getting paid to do this for criminal organizations. They need to be able to make a bigger return on investment. So we've seen these attackers go against small businesses now um, and taking you know, their checking accounts, 100 grand out right before payroll on Friday, uh, things like that because they know there's going to be more money there than to take at one time. And they're using more sophisticated malware because as defenses have gotten better, um, the attackers know they have to mean, maintain persistency. They have to be able to uh, stay on your machine to be able to hopefully defraud you multiple times. So these global threats are really changing uh, you know, kind of every day, but the key targets of all these threats is still the United States. So it's the largest target uh, of the attacks. Uh, and it still is by far the, the top of the heap. Now we saw recently, I think everybody has seen this in the news, um, Target was impacted and, and you know, very, very large impact on their business around their breach. And if you look at what happened at Target, there's a couple different things that came together. Uh, one, you know, the organization was attacked with a relatively sophisticated attack. Two, they ignored the alerts that came from their own security software, so they didn't have the internal processes to be able to deal with the security pieces. And as I alluded to earlier, Imagine IT is being pulled in so many different directions, and then you have security things on top of it. It's difficult to stay on top of things. Um, and so when this all kind of came out and the breach occurred, you know, really what happened is it affected their business dramatically. They've already spent 100, or sorry, $61 million so far uh, in just Q4 expenses helping to address this breach. If any of you have actually been to a Target, you'll see that there's people standing by the doors um, with information about the breach if you were affected by it and they're signing up forms for you if you have any identification that shows fraudulent charges, they're going to go ahead and record that and cut you a check. So Target is actually self-insuring all of their customers against this breach. And um, these credit cards from the Target breach are still being actively sold every day. And so they're really unsure what the future costs are going to be when it comes to this uh, business impact because they just don't know. They, these credit cards are still being shopped around. Um, there's actually a couple blogs that actively track these credit cards uh, from the target breaches and where they're going. So, you know, we don't know what's going to happen to Target in general, but we do know it's, it's definitely uh, derailing their focus from being a retailer into essentially having to be a security company for a period of time now to find out what they've got to fix and how they want to fix it. So, uh, Target showed also another thing is that lots of things were happening at once. We had this uh, malware getting on point of sale systems. We had alerts being generated. We had network activity when they were trying to copy out the data. Um, we also had HVAC contractors involved because their credentials allowed the attackers to 
the malware on the network in the first place. So you've got a multi-front war that the security team is having to fight. And really the only way we've found effectively to fight against this is using what I call intelligence. It's context and it's additional information. Now I'm not uh, advocating here, you know, log everything, big data overload, so you're kind of, you know, an analysis paralysis type of uh, situation. But it's about picking the right type of data to get the right type of context so you can make a better move. You can make a better decision of how you want to respond. And I think what's happening in too many organizations today, uh, and, and you know, I think CryptoLocker will talk a little bit about this as a good example of it, is that we focus on the wrong threats. We focus on the things that don't make a big impact. Um, I know lots of folks who have heard about CryptoLocker, especially security professionals, but they still don't understand the impact that it does in the organization. Uh, compared to other threats, it's a heck of a lot worse threat. So if you have the opportunity to try to solve the crypto locker problem versus a different problem, I strongly advise you to start focusing on the crypto locker issue um, and start taking the intelligence you're getting from your security tools, your IT tools, and you leverage that to make better security decisions rather than just collecting it so that in case something happens, you have some logs to look at and figure out what went wrong. So you really need to focus on that, that context. So I hope that gave you a little bit of a wrap of kind of where security is in general. Um, you know, things are changing very rapidly. But let's go ahead and talk a little bit more about CryptoLocker and, you know, its specific type of malware and what it's doing. So I'll give you a couple of key metrics here. Um, CryptoLocker represented 40% of all breaches last year. Or sorry, malware in general represented 40% of all breaches last year. So majority of the time a, a company is attacked, a malware is being used to exfiltrate the data to either property for a company. 82% uh, of that malware is detonated through some type of back door. So there's many different flavors, of course, as you know, for malware. But what, what has really changed in the past two years is that these things are now working together. Before you had one author who would write one whole piece of malware from start to end, and it would start going ahead and using that. That's just not how it's happening anymore. Now you have these uh, various malicious authors teaming up with each other so that they have a guy who wrote a password dumper uh, working with someone else who's grabbing a rootkit tool, who's working with somebody who's integrating this into their spyware tool. So they're really kind of putting this all together, um, and they're trying to use best of breed malicious products, if you will, just like you do in your IT environment. You want best of breed products. Uh, they're doing the same thing. And so we see a lot of times most malware is no longer being delivered just by a, a spam or, or email. A lot of times it's being delivered by other software. So the software you've started to trust becomes malicious in a certain way, shape, or form and starts delivering you know, bad things to you. So um, this is bigger than just solving the, the web uh, problem that's out there. Now, CryptoLocker itself has uh, been a very unique type of malware, and there are a couple reasons why. One, it's been highly evasive uh, in terms of antivirus technology. And the reason it's been evasive is the authors have really focused on making sure that they can easily uh, with do what we call armoring or changing the binary itself so it's no longer detected by antivirus. Uh, as you guys may be aware, antivirus uses signatures to be able to identify if this is a piece of malware or not. And signatures are essentially just looking for certain strings or bytes within that binary. And so if you change those bytes around, obfuscate them and, and whatnot, it easily bypasses antivirus. So we've seen different versions of CryptoLock or 10, 15 different versions released in a single day. So you're talking highly, highly automated uh, ways to evade antivirus. We've also seen that it exhibits multiple behaviors at different times. So you install it on one machine, and over the next 10 minutes, it does X, Y, Z. On a different machine, over that 10-minute period, it does nothing. So it's also exhibiting different behaviors as well as uh, protecting itself from antivirus. Um, the rearming, as I mentioned, is definitely a problem, and it's continuing to be a problem. And it's a reason why systems like uh, what CounterTech produces have been put on the market uh, because we look at behavioral analytics rather than signatures. So we're not looking for bytes and things like that. We're looking for the actual things that happen on the operating system. You know, for example, CryptoLocker encrypting files. Uh, and once CryptoLocker infiltrates a system, it disguises itself with a bunch of different variant options. Uh, and there's actually been copycat versions of CryptoLocker that have been released. And so it's funny now you're doing an analysis on CryptoLocker, and this may actually be a copycat. It may be a malicious author wrote a, a, a version of CryptoLocker that isn't from the real CryptoLocker authors. It's a complete copycat clone. Uh, and they're doing that to be able to uh, infiltrate the groups that leverage CryptoLocker. So they're arguably uh, being malicious against their own malicious counterparts. So a very interesting ecosystem that CryptoLocker has created, and uh, it's not going away. So CryptoLocker is definitely getting worse. Now, 
what is CryptoLocker? Well, it's a type of malware that falls into a category named ransomware. So ransomware is very simply the old school mechanism of organized crime uh, where they're going ahead and providing protection. So if you, for example, had a store back in the 1920s or 1930s, a retail store, uh, the mafia or whatnot would come up and say, hey, um, you know, if you don't pay us X number of dollars per month uh, to protect you, something bad might happen to your store. And then next thing you know, you don't pay them and they come and actually destroy your store. So it's kind of a extortion and ransom type of racket just in the digital world. So the Vic computer is hijacked. Um, there's multiple ways. We'll talk about how it gets hijacked. But once it's hijacked, it goes out and it starts actually gathering all the data on the system and encrypting it. Depending on the version of CryptoLocker, it could be a uh, you know looking for files like your video files, or it could be a, the original version, which is actually a little bit more dangerous, all your Word documents, Excel documents, et cetera, that you may be using in a business function. And it leverages encryption to go ahead and this data. So the data is still there, but it's encrypted. You can't use it. And uh, they then provide to you a simple way through a service, I mentioned before, a website that you can submit money to them. Uh, now they mostly use Bitcoin, but it used to be a couple other different things, uh, money packs and, and uh, things like that, where you can pay them with money, um, and they go ahead and give you the key to go ahead and encrypt all your data and get it back. Now, what's amazing about CryptoLocker is that actually it was one of the first ransomwares where they would actually give you the key. So if you do pay these folks, you will actually get your data back uh, in many cases. Uh, I wouldn't always assume that, but um, you, it has been seen that you will get your data back. And so they really are running this as a service. I mean, uh, the folks that leverage CryptoLocker to make money, they actually have phone numbers they can call up and get support on how they're infecting PCs um, and things like that. It's, it's a very structured business, if you will, uh, from the malicious side. And uh, the way that the CryptoLocker usually gets on systems is a variety of mechanisms. Some of it is through RDP. They're actually sending out RDP uh, brute forcing attacks, looking to log into servers, and they'll install CryptoLocker when they log in. A weak passwords, as well as email, drive bys etc. So ransomware is um, a pretty aggressive and new way that we're seeing attackers leverage things. And I mentioned before about how identity theft was a big thing, but now not so much. What we've seen is that ransomware has come about because they're just not making as much as they used to. Uh, the new ways to do bank fraud and stealing information from your online banking account, uh, you know, Chase and those of organizations have really stepped up their game, and so it's much harder to steal money out of an online banking account. And ransoming is just so much easier. So how does CryptoLocker look? Well, this is the actual screen you'd see if you got CryptoLocker installed on your machine. Uh, usually what happens is you accidentally download malware from a spoofed email attachment, um, or maybe it's a drive-by download because you went to a malicious website. Executable executes, runs on your system, and it starts communicating with a command and control server. And that command and control server generates an encryption key, as well as another encryption key called a public key. And so the attackers here are leveraging a type of cryptography that is mostly used to secure business communications, et cetera, uh, to actually go ahead and, and hold ransom your data. So what's interesting about CryptoLocker, a lot of people think, oh, my, if I can find out the password, um, I can go ahead and get my data back. There is no password. The password is actually stored on the remote server at the command and control server that the attackers have under their control. So there's no way to actually decrypt your files unless you get access to that server. Um, so it stores those, as I mentioned, on that secret server. The problem you have is a lot of times that server changes. One day it's in uh, you know, Russia, the next day it's in the United States, the next day it's in Canada. And um, if the server isn't running at a certain time, you can't get your data back no matter what. So we've seen cases where businesses have had a rash of crypto locker infection and say 100 machines are infected by this, and they decide they're just going to pay it to get their data back. They find out that the server that has their key is gone. And so uh, you'll have this pop-up warning, and you have no ability to actually pay them because the attackers have already moved on. So they generally usually have 72 hours. You see the countdown timer there um, that's telling you how much time you have left before they destroy the private key on the server. Um, and they do they used to destroy the private key for 72 hours, and you would be kind of SOL. Um, now there's new services that have come up where instead of paying $300 to get your key, if you're willing to pay $5,000 after the 72-hour timer expires, they'll give you the key. So they've said, oh, we can make more money if we uh, let it expire and just jack up the price. And so uh, we've seen prices range from $1,000, $5,000 to get keys back after that 72-hour uh, timer has expired. So crypto locker, as we mentioned, is you know devastating. You can imagine losing all your data. Um, and so you know, I mentioned earlier, we have an approach that's more behavioral on how to solve this. I wanted to briefly mention how behavioral analysis uh, with our product helps solve the crypto locker problem. So you know, first, we're 
monitoring everything that's happening in the workstations and servers in the network uh, from a stealth perspective. You can't see us. You don't see any of our software running. Attackers can't see it running either. We're gathering all the data, and we're gathering every single thing that's happening in that operating system, and we're correlating it to look for behavioral trends and patterns. Uh, so those behavioral patterns, for example, would be the locker starting to access all your files uh, very quickly and starting to encrypt them and rewriting those files back to the hard drive. We see that as a behavior. We also see CryptoLocker's behavior of popping up the pop-up box and you know interfacing with you with a timer, things like that. And so we leverage this technology. An example of this would be you know you entering a USB drive, for example, into a computer. Uh, we see that all of a sudden all run.exe runs, random.exe runs, uh, etc. We start looking at everything those binaries do. And say, for example, random.exe starts killing antivirus. We see that key event. We go ahead and would notify you that hey, somebody just turned off antivirus. And it looks like they're starting to delete other files as well. And when we see this activity, we can tell you this is the uh, advanced persistent threat called Dark Soul. Right? And we're looking at this from a behavioral perspective. We're not investigating binaries or anything like that. It's purely behavioral. So our approach uh, can help with some of the best practices that I want to talk about as well here and how to prevent uh, attacks like CryptoLocker in general. So of course, you can implement something like our solution, next generation endpoint threat detection and analysis. Um, but you can also really just focus on some of the basic having strong password policies, given that CryptoLocker spreads a lot of times just by weak passwords on systems. If they're able to get your Windows machine with a you know admin admin like password and run a program, uh, they'll do it. Same with this with RDP uh, remote desktop. So people have PCs open to the internet. They have remote desktop enabled. Next thing you know, attackers are logging in through remote desktop and running CryptoLocker. Um, also, making sure everything's patched and up to date is vital as well. And uh, we've seen, you know, patching can really help solve these problems. But also understanding that CryptoLocker is a little bit different. Uh, it's not the same type of malware out there. So understanding that this is a real threat, that if you ignore that timer, if your user just ignores that 72-hour timer, uh, you're going to have a very, very difficult time getting that back if you don't have backups. Now, the best way to actually solve this, and, and the reason why we've, you know, worked here with Intronis is that the best way to solve CryptoLocker issues is to have backups. Uh, that's the number one best practice I can recommend to you from a security perspective because if the data can get destroyed essentially and you can recover it very quickly, you don't have to worry about paying that ransom. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and hand it over now here to, uh, to Nathan and he's going to give you a little bit more detail on uh, backups and how you can use them to solve crypto locker problems. Thanks, Mike. That was an awesome overview on, on the crypto locker and security industry as a whole there. So I just want to talk a little bit about you know backups in general, as Mike mentioned, and you know how partners can really go ahead and protect themselves. And what's very unique about CryptoLocker is that it attacks everything. So we actually found partners had network shares and network drives that were being attacked, and a lot of those volumes actually had backups on them themselves. So we're very much about recommending that partners go ahead and back their data up off the off-site specifically. And when you're using tape devices, whether you're taking out drives or using a product like Intronus, it's just crucial that you go ahead and you take that media and physically move it away, where a virus like CryptoLocker or malware like CryptoLocker can't affect that data off-site. It's also really important to make sure that you're backing up regularly. Uh, oftentimes, partners will go ahead and only back up you know, once or twice a week, maybe once a month, and think that's sufficient. In the reality, it's not. In the data-driven world today, partners and customers rely more on data and access to their most recent data than any other time. And it's just continuing to become more and more of a critical uh, business operation to have access to their data in real time. Um, so again, it's really important to go ahead and regularly back up data off-site so that it's not within the customer's local environment or within the end user's local environment. So the crypto lock virus has the potential to go ahead and attack it and, and be doing that regularly. As far as Intronus, um, specific about how we can go ahead and help, well, we actually use a proprietary data file format. So one of the common things that the CryptoLocker uh, malware was doing was encrypting business documents, files, folders, and we actually even heard reports of variants that were going after common backup uh, formats, BKF, uh, BAK, and so forth. So Intronus actually uses uh, a slightly different file format that doesn't have that extension, and, and by no means is uh, security through security, but it definitely makes a difference when it comes to the CryptoLocker. From an encryption standpoint, again, go ahead and we have a proprietary file format. So as data is being generated, it's wrapped up in our 
And we actually have a lot of different checks and balances on the Entrona system to make sure that it's been touched. We kind of have a good idea what's happening inside there. What's also very different about the Entrona solution is the way that the data should transfer off into the Entrona cloud. So we can't have a, a third-party software, a third-party action go ahead and trigger and access data up in the Entronos cloud. We have a really tight integration so that only our specific software can go ahead and create any manipulation of data that's been transferred up to the Entronos cloud. So even though a, a virus may hit the system locally, it has absolutely no chance whatsoever of going ahead and attacking the Entronos cloud. Just as Mike talked about how uh, a lot of these attackers are no longer going after the banks themselves because it's just too difficult, same exact situation with a product like Entronos. It's too difficult for the attackers to go ahead and penetrate our security mechanisms in place. They're just going to go ahead and focus on the data locally and that you don't have backups. As far as some other details that are really important for partners to think about, is retention history. So a lot of our citing tapes, they typically go ahead and they're taking that nice tape take it off site and okay let's hope that tape or let's hope that hard drive is good and you know there's no real retention history on that. And what's really interesting about CryptoLocker is that when the infection starts to when it ends, we don't have a really good conscience to say okay it's exactly five minutes, it's exactly six days. It's still a little moving by details on, on the overall infection time. So it's possible that over a course of three days as a customer is taking hard drives home or tapes home, that that actually has half reporters all the way encrypted. So it could be actually too late if you're taking that data off-site. So having multiple recovery points that you can go ahead and revert back to over a several week time span makes a tremendous difference. So that if it takes a week or two for the crypto locker to go ahead and, and rip through the system, so we can go ahead and recover back files prior to that period of time. One of the features that the Intronus partners really loved, and uh, I'll actually be showing that this afternoon, is, is the feature that we can go ahead and actually recover by date. So we don't have to go ahead and choose file by file by file. We can go ahead and just scroll, select a particular recovery point, select that particular folder that was affected, and then go ahead and recover everything all at once. So it just makes that recovery process super easy, super painless, and super simple for partners to go ahead and attack. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and switch gears over and actually walk through a, a product demonstration here. And what's really nice about the Intronus Management Portal is that we're able to go ahead and I'll actually click screen's not sharing, so let's give it one more try here. All right. So it's inside of our management dashboard. Uh, partners are able to go ahead and access multiple different features. Everything from provisioning accounts to creating backup sets to running restoration, that can actually all be done through our management report. And for managed service providers, it's really nice because we show a, a clean hierarchy with inside here where partners can go ahead and see all of the accounts they have currently configured on the solution and then be able to go ahead and adjust computers within the system. And what's really cool for a lot of partners is that we can go ahead and control the installations that are out there in the field. We've got complete control to be able to go ahead and manipulate backups and start them and stop them and delete them and go ahead and specify those much longer retention periods within the system. And to be able to go ahead and back up virtual machines from both Hyper-V and VMware as well as other hypervisors and be able to go ahead and focus on that critical data with a nice long retention period it makes a big difference for partners and they really appreciate it. The restoration standpoint, partners are able to very easily go ahead and recover data back out to their customers' environment. Again, because we've got this web portal. So as long as the partners have access into our website, they can really go ahead and run the restorations. And we can see from the list of various plugins, we've got plugins for system state, SQL Server, virtual machines, exchange, both at databases level as a mess, as well as these files and folders. And as I mentioned earlier, to be able to go ahead and recover back to a particular choosing one of my more recent recovery points here, expanding out the directory structure and just simply check the box to the left of the data structure within the 
And now I know all of the files that are in this folder are going to get ahead and be recovered back to the way it was a couple days ago. What's also nice is that I can go ahead and choose if I want to go ahead and restore this data back to an alternative location, the original location. I've got a bunch of back. So really, really helpful for our members. Really today, I just want to go ahead and give you a quick taste of the Intronus Management Portal. Uh, if you're interested in a full demo, uh, Richard will definitely give you all the contact information, but uh, we can go ahead and pick the sales team and get you all scheduled on there. So Richard, I'm going to go ahead and pass it right back over to you. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, thanks for giving uh, everybody a, a taste of the Intronus product there. So uh, what are the key takeaways today? Uh, the fact is that these kinds of attacks are more complex uh, and the, the actual effect that it's having on business is becoming more and more significant. And malware is, is, is taking a much bigger chunk of the pie uh, compared to uh, you know, viruses and more of the traditional types of attacks. Um, you know, along the lines of what Mike was saying, the endpoint threat detection uh, provides better protection than what we've had in the past. Um, and what you really need uh, is, a, in addition to uh, making sure that you're using some kind of security, uh, you need a backup solution as well. Um, and uh, thanks to Nathan for, uh, uh, for showing us how Intronus helps protect clients against CryptoLocker. So uh, we're at the questions portion now. We've had some great questions come in. So the first one I'd like to put to Mike, and this is from Patty Hayes. How is it that we are not able to find the criminals behind CryptoLocker? Yeah, great question. Um, it's actually pretty simple. It's because they're somewhat protected. Um, there's a couple other countries where this type of activity is not necessarily bad. Um, Russia is a great example of this, where some of the largest uh, rings of malicious activity are directly linked to uh, politicians and, and other what we'll call protected individuals within Russia. Um, same with other countries around the world. Uh, the second reason why is that they're pretty smart. As I mentioned before, there's a lot of partnerships and um, you know teamwork that's being used now in the malware communities. What that really ends up meaning is lots of distribution. So things go through somebody else, through somebody else, through somebody else, and it takes a long time to track back that trail. Uh, and the last reason is uh, fundamentally a technology reason. Uh, one of the approaches CryptoLocker takes is what's called dynamic domain generation. Um, so they use an algorithm, a mathematical algorithm, to generate the domains that actually host their command and control servers. And this algorithm changes uh, every time they release the product. And since they are the only ones that know the algorithm, a command and control server may only be available for four hours. And then it switches to a different server for another four hours. And it keeps hopping around. So it has six different servers it communicates to in a 24-hour period. And um, that type of domain generation algorithm is very difficult for us as defenders to go ahead and attack against and find where they are because it's constantly rotating. And um, those algorithms change. So once we crack the algorithm, it's no longer really effective. Um, so all those three things added together make it a pretty tough job to try to find out who it is. Uh, there is a belief, though, in the industry that CryptoLocker isn't a single person. It's a group. And um, we actually do believe that CryptoLocker has changed hands before, meaning it was one group and then it was maybe sold off or went out to another group as well. So um, you definitely see as tools become more prolific and generate more return, uh, they have a better value in the black market and uh, other companies, other malicious companies may want to buy it. Great, thanks for that Mike. Um, so this is a question for Nathan. Um, a question from Harun Hasumi. How does having multiple versions of data being backed up impact total size? Yeah, it really depends on the backup solution that you're leveraging. If you're leveraging a solution like Intronus, not a heck of a lot. Um, so Intronus actually provides proprietary delta blocking technology uh, that allows the partner to go ahead and basically break up those critical files and folders into a million billion pieces. And we're consistently scanning those pieces of those files to determine what portions have gone ahead and changed and uploading just those portions. So as we start to look long term, you know, how long does it, how much is it to maintain 10 days versus 10 weeks versus multiple years? It's actually not a heck of a lot of difference. So it becomes really efficient for an insurance partner 
to go ahead and increase the version history from two weeks to, say, six weeks and not really incur any additional charge, which is pretty cool. Yeah, great. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, so we've got a comment from uh, Brett Brown here that I'd like to share with everybody, but I hope you don't mind. Um, and he writes, remember the crypto locker doesn't only affect local files residing on a computer, but also any network locations that a specific user is granted access to, such as servers, peripherals, um, NAS devices, et cetera. So uh, yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a great point. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and that's exactly the reason why it's crucial to make sure that you're using an off-site solution where the data is being taken off-site and doesn't remain on-site. Uh, these viruses are getting, and crypto lockers and malwares and such, are getting more and more and more sophisticated. And I'm sure Mike can attest to this, that the percolation into the network is just going to get worse and worse and worse. So where you only have basic access, it just gets spread throughout the entire network. So uh, basically some scary stuff. Okay, great. Well, um, uh, uh, just we do have uh, more questions, but we don't have time for them right now. So we'll make sure that we follow up with each of you who've asked questions uh, to make sure that we get to those. Uh, but in the interest of time, um, I uh, just uh, I'm just moving on. Um, so <clears throat> connecting with Counterattack, um, it's been great having Mike on the call today. Uh, I know I've learned an enormous amount about CryptoLocker, and I hope you guys have too. Uh, you can uh, you can visit. Crypt Counterattack on their website, uh, counterattack.com. Also, be sure to follow Mike on Twitter. His handle is mdavidceo. And if you're interested in learning more about the world of malware, hacking, cyber attacks, etc., you can pick up Mike's book, Hacking Exposed Malware and Rootkit Secrets and Solutions. The book offers real-world case studies and examples that reveal how today's hackers use readily available tools to infiltrate and hijack systems. It also offers step-by-step -step countermeasures to help you detect and eliminate malicious attacks. It's a great guide for any IT provider looking to keep their clients secure. So be sure to check it out on Amazon.com. Uh, then also, uh, here we are at Intronis. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if uh, any of you had a chance to download the guide, I know a couple of people had trouble with this when we first put it up. It is. The link is case sensitive, um, but I also provided an alternative link in the chat window uh, for you to, uh, to go and download our CryptoLocker tech guide. Um, but also, feel free to give us a call uh, on the number on the screen. We'd love to hear from you. You can also try out the Introna solution yourself on the website. Uh, it's free to try. Uh, you can go uh, to the home page. It's uh, a big button there, start my free trial. You can also follow the uh, introns.com slash free trial shortcut as well. So we encourage you to uh, try that out. And then uh, there's a handful of different ways that you can get in touch with us. Uh, there's that phone number again, and feel free to uh, follow us on uh, Twitter. Uh, take a look at the blog, uh, which uh, has, uh, has a ton of uh, useful information on there, and, and a lot of recent stuff has been around uh, ransomware and, uh, and, and crypto locker. So we encourage you to go there. So with that, uh, I'd like to again say a big thank you to Mike uh, for a very informative presentation today, and Nathan uh, for uh, for a great demo of the of the Intronix software. Uh, and thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, we do intend to send out a recording of this webinar to those who are interested. Uh, so we'll make sure you all get that in a in a follow up email. Uh, but for now, that closes the session. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a great day.